Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Well, Julie, welcome. I'm so Thank glad you. you're here. It's so and nice to be here. <laughs> I like to have that answer, too. Thank you. Tell me, how did you get interested uh, in photography as a career? I don't know that I actually got interested in it as a career. It was always a hobby. And I really didn't think that it was going to lead me anywhere because it was um, something that I did for fun and it was an art an artistic outlet for me. I never expected that it would actually one day pay me and support me and give me the lifestyle that I so longed for. And so before you made it a focus of your remuneration, what were you doing? Uh, well, I was on the other side of the camera. I was a model. And so I was around photography all the time. I was um, working with amazing photographers. I was traveling a lot and uh, always from a from a, from a critical point of view, I was always looking at photographs of myself to try and improve them, to try and make them better. And that's why I first picked up a camera, because I was curious why some people made me look good and relaxed and other people made me look like I was older, beyond my years. And so it was really, it, was, it started as an investigation, just taking pictures of my friends. And what, uh, as a, from a model's point of view, what did you learn from those pictures about Anything, lighting, timing, sun, attitude, your frame of mind, the photographer's frame of mind. Photographer's frame of mind was probably the most important thing. If they wanted us to have a fun day, we had a fun day and we looked good. If they were going to torture us, which some of them like to do, it was going to be a hard day and didn't always get the results that they wanted. But if people made me feel good, I always looked good. And lighting was also important. There was a photographer in, in Italy um, called Bob Krieger. And when I was about 20, I used to work with him a lot. And he had a very big, beautiful studio. And he had very soft white light. And I would watch all the women that were working. Because in an average photo shoot, there were probably 10 or 15 other people involved, not just the model and the photographer. The clients, who were these Italian women, usually in their 40s and 50s, would walk into the studio and they'd throw off their coat and they'd walk into the makeup room where the, what we were getting ready and they'd look at themselves in the mirror and the lighting was very soft and pretty and they'd be like, oh, I look so good when I come to Bob Krieger's studio, I don't have to do anything. And that was, that was sort of this thing, I, I suddenly realized what was happening because in his studio it was very different and I mean, he, we knew the minute we walked in that this, it was just magical. It was white and light and pretty and he was there telling us all we were gorgeous and everybody was gorgeous and everybody felt gorgeous. So that was, that was the biggest lesson I think I had, that if you can make people feel good about themselves, however it is, either with words or having soft pretty lighting or a glass of champagne if it's necessary or candy or whatever it is, if I can make people feel comfortable, then I know I'm going to get a good result. And, but staying with Bob just a moment, mm. uh, is that something he ever discussed with you? Did you ever ask I him? I did ask him. I did. I said to him, you have beautiful lighting in here to make everybody feel good, right? Yeah. Like, yeah? And he goes, oh, how did you know my secret? And then uh. he just laughed and passed it on. But it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary because when you looked in the mirror at Bob Krieger's studio, even if you arrived tired in the morning, you looked better than you did anywhere else. <laughs> Well, that's certainly something we could consider in our living rooms and bedrooms. Well, I was, I have a hairdresser in New York who changed salons and she went from a salon that was very light and bright to one that was black with overhead lighting. Oh. And uh, can I tell you, I didn't last there very long. It was unattractive. It was, it didn't make me feel good. And luckily she moved back to the old salon, <laughs> but no, bright and light is what it's all about. But you're sort of handheld photography, so how do you mm -hmm. give that feeling of lighting, the calmness and the beauty of lighting, when you're with someone? 
Well, now I have two or three different areas of photography. I actually have quite a lot of. I have a very interesting career because I don't just do one thing. Yes. So when it's a wedding, it's an unscripted script. We never right. know what's going to happen, except that we know there's a girl and a boy, and they're going to get, well, not even. Sometimes there's a girl and a girl or a boy and a boy. But it's two people that are going to get married. And um, you don't always have good lighting. You, I don't have a say in what happens. I'm there just to capture the moments and the images as they happen and to try and capture the story as it happens. So my job, firstly, is to make sure that the girl or whoever I'm photographing is feeling comfortable with me in the room. So I have to establish very quickly, in a, in a matter of seconds, I have to make them feel relaxed. Sometimes it's by going in and just gently touching them, you know, oh, your hair looks beautiful, or I love your pearls, or oh, that's a beautiful watch you're wearing, or something to engage them just very gently. And then I step back and I start taking photos. And, and then I, it's a, it becomes a sort of a dance with how close that person feels comfortable with me being. Sometimes people like me very close and sometimes people like me far away. So that's my job to learn that at a wedding. Um, when you're doing a portrait, I have a little bit more control because I'm given a, a person to photograph and usually a location. Uh, then I've discovered for me, I have to be very quick. So I have to set my picture up and do it in five minutes. That's it. I've got five minutes of time. I'm not one of these people that will have somebody stand there for two hours and set it all yeah. up. So that's how I work. And that, so I find that just by being quick uh, But for someone in the studio, is it the same uh, general approach about relax them by engaging them briefly by touch or compliment mm. before they sit or stand yeah. for the photo? Well, it, it depends. If there's, yes, there's always something nice to be said to everybody. Yes. And I think we live in a world where we don't get complimented enough. I agree. Mm -hmm. So it's my job to compliment people. And I enjoy that job. I've been given that job. That's my job in life, <laughs> to give everybody compliments and then to give them pictures that reflect the compliments that I've given. That's oh my, my God, Julie, I just love, <laughs> I love that because I tend to give compliments, but when I do, they are just from the heart. People say, yeah. thank you. I say, it's nothing to do yeah. with me. <laughs> it's all you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just think it adds a little energy, a mm -hmm. positive energy into mm -hmm. life and brightens people's experience for the moment. I hope so. Yeah, I yes, well, <laughs> I hope so too. I think so. Do people at weddings, when you say come close or go far, Separate from the cultural, do you think it has to do with whether they introverts or extroverts or um, what would make a difference? Yes, I think you're right. Introverted people tend to want you further away. Extroverted people like to feel your presence. That's probably a good observation. I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. I would think that would be it. Uh, and also pacing. But sometimes, sometimes an introvert needs protection. They need a little somebody by their side. So then sometimes they want you closer to protect them from the other people, even though you're holding the camera. Oh, interesting. So, How can you tell that? I don't know. I, 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 it's not something you can think about. It's just something that, you it's flow something that I feel. You I feel. Yes. I mean, sometimes I really know that somebody really wants me 10 feet away. And that's fine. I have a long lens. Yeah. <laughs> the photos look like I'm very close later. So. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That's really wonderful. Have you ever been tempted to go into digital now that it has appeared? I am totally digital at this point. Are you? Oh, I yes. didn't know that. Yes, yes. And I love it. It's very ecological compared with film. I don't have any nasty chemicals. Um, even the people that shoot film, they all scan their film after they've done it, but they have the processes in between to get it to the scan thing. So anyway, yes, I turned digital um, in 2007. So, oh. Yeah. And uh, do you take training or did you take training to... Uh, I hired a person to come in and help me because it was a very different thing to photographing with film. It it's, um, has much more detail. Yes. Digital, digital clarity. Yes, it does, and that's not always a good thing. Yes, I took a self-portrait with my very first digital camera, and I was like, "Oh, there's looks like there's white stuff." Yeah. Oh, it's dandruff. Oops. 
<laughs> no, we don't need that. We don't we don't need to see that. So yeah, so I had to learn how to soften things up. And then did you, uh, do, and a lot of people edit afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is that something you do? Oh, yes, I edit everything. And uh, I, at the beginning I had somebody that once you edited it, once I edited it, somebody else would take it and then color correct it and do little changes to it. Now I do that myself unless I'm really overloaded with work and then I have a very trusted assistant, personal assistant who comes in and helps me. Uh, do that because you yeah. like the sense of feeling for the color adjustment? Yes, yes. A lot happens in post-production in digital. In the, in the past when I had film I would send it to a lab, they would process a film and then somebody would actually look at every single image as she was making the prints and she would make adjustments. So right. she would change the density, the, the brightness or the darkness and the color. She would actually control the color of my prints. And I didn't realize that's what was happening because I just sent my film and it came back looking great. And when I first started with digital, my pictures weren't always perfect when they came out of the camera. And what my digital technician explained to me was, oh yes, of course it doesn't come out perfect. That's what the girl in the lab used to do. Now you have to have somebody do it for you. Either yourself, you have to learn or hire somebody to do it for you. So what does the experience from modeling give you as a photographer, especially in the early days? Well, my experiences with Bob Krieger and other photographers that I worked with first gave me an understanding of, of that if people felt comfortable, which was my biggest lesson, that if yeah. I could make people feel comfortable, yeah. they'd look good. That was my first thing. And then the second thing, I think we all want to be beautiful. Yes. And uh, so it's finding a way to make people look beautiful. Well, they are beautiful, but how do you put it on film? And, and not everybody has had a nice photo taken of themselves because they haven't always felt comfortable or they yes. haven't been put in the nice light or they haven't had somebody take the time to take a nice picture that they felt comfortable with. So those are things that I learned from modeling. But there's so many things. You know, I learned about light, obviously, that there's all different kinds of lights and some yes. lights are more flattering than others. So um, those are the tools of my trade that I learned from modeling. Well, that's uh, certainly useful in anything. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking of the times people say, take a picture, and I go, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Got that yeah. smile up there. Yeah, you know? right. Or do something like uh, right. that. But there's power in beauty, isn't there? I, I think so. And what is your experience? Well, I love it. <laughs> yes, yes. I love all things beautiful, flowers, people, places, and I, I, like it. I gravitate towards it. Yes. The, um, I often wonder, you know, people say someone has shifty eyes or they have dark skin or they're, you know, pink or whatever, whatever, and that that bleeds over to people's impressions of them uh, a character, as a character, as a personality. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder if people who um, aren't particularly attractive, if they were really attractive, whatever they said wouldn't have more um, a sense of enchanting others or persuading others or accepted by others. And I just wondered if not so beautiful is a pushback. I think we all have to find what it is that we want to share with the world. and. Beauty comes in all different disguises. Yes. It's not necessarily how somebody looks on the outside. It can be how somebody acts. And, and uh, so I think maybe beauty is a connection rather than just a thing. Maybe it's a way we connect with people and some people like to connect in an elegant, sophisticated, gentle way. Other people like to do it in an aggressive way. People have different ways of connecting. So. When I say beauty, I, I can't just say I'm talking about model beauty because I'm not. I'm talking right. about there's something really amazing about a great big burly guy on a Harley Davidson. I mean, that's got some attractiveness to me as well, but it's very different to the young girl. And I'm just as excited about photographing him and showing his beauty, which is very different to that of the, the young girl. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it not only makes sense, but it broadens the discussion. 
because what I'm thinking about is, I think people react to people's energy sometimes, you mm -hmm. know, if they're appealing or if they're friendly or they're mm -hmm. not friendly or they're down day or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so when you say Harley Davidson, you're reacting to that man's sort of excitement of being yeah. male and strong yeah. and fast and right. whatever. Right. And yeah. But it has an appeal. Or it does you have, have an authenticity. Or, and it certainly has an appeal to a certain group of people. So, you know, we're all different and we're all attracted to different things. Again, I love beauty, but it's maybe it's maybe it's another word for truth and honesty but i want everybody to look beautiful does that make sense yes but the i think that there are layers to beauty yeah. that's what you're trying like, to say like i know that women don't want to see their wrinkles okay so i think that most women don't want to see their wrinkles so yes. i have to photograph them in a way that they don't show now a guy we now we're stuck with the harley davidson guy but a guy doesn't necessarily he doesn't he does want to see his wrinkles because they're distinguished looking and he's earned Earn them. them and so you know how I approach photographing a man is going to be different than how I approach photographing a woman I've photographed men looking like women by mistake because I made the light too pretty and soft and that I had to learn to beef it up a little bit for the boys oh interesting is the the concept of beauty different in Australia you're Australian Mm, that's interesting. Well, I haven't lived there in a long time. I remember going back in about 1980 because I, I left I left no, 82 because I left Australia in 1978 to model, and uh, I went home and everyone had cut their hair off. <laughs> everyone had short hair. All the girls and all the boys had short hair. It was an oddest thing. And it's changed, but it was just for a couple of years there. They all they all turned androgynous. But mm, I'm happy to report that the girls have all grown their hair long again and. And they're certainly not androgynous anymore. When we went to Australia the first time, all I expected to have a different sense of, of um, I don't know, aesthetics in the culture. Mm. But I found all the magazines were veered towards American yes. aesthetics and American activities. So I, yeah, I think the Kardashians have infiltrated the world. <laughs> I know it's mm. really kind of a surprise. And tell me about your early life. I uh, read in your bio that you had grandmothers as actresses. Yes, I did. It did. My, my grandmother on my father's side was actually a chorus dancer in England before World War I. And uh, my grandfather was the manager of the uh, Alhambra Club, which was a, a club um, place. And he picked her out of the chorus line and married her, which was a little bit risque at those, in those days. And yeah. then my mother's mother was also an actress. And she was mostly, uh, she, she did rep theater all around England and and she married my grandfather just before World War II and they moved to Australia so and then my father's parents moved to Australia as well so somehow my parents ended up being in Australia and I got I was born there <laughs> but yeah when it was far away it's it not far, far away, away now no. I mean Exactly. Uh, interest wise. Yeah. So did you grow up in a city or on a ranch or? No, 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 no. I grew up in Sydney. Uh, it was a, a, um, a beautiful area where I grew up. It was very cultural. It was very small. It was, a, it was actually a peninsula and um, it, was a, it was a very interesting area. A lot of artists have come out of the area where I grew up in. A lot of writers, screenwriters. It was just, I don't know why, but my mother thinks that because we were a peninsula, we were a little bit isolated. Mm. And we had a very good school program th with arts at school. So we yeah. did a lot of, and you know, it was the 60s. So there was a lot of crafty things going on. We were learning pottery after school and macrame and painting and lots of kind of creative things were going on around me. And what prompted the flying from the nest? For modeling, I mean, that, to leave the country, where you started modeling in, in Australia? Yes, no, I, I, I originally wanted to act. I, I auditioned for NIDA, which is the National Institute of Dramatic Arts. I did not get in. Well, you should have. No, I should not have. I was not very good. Um, but I had this ambition, and I thought, well, I, I'll work for a year in, in a store, and I'll do things here, and then I'll re-audition in a year to try again. And then... A friend of my mum's was a makeup artist, and she said, well, why don't you try modeling in the year? Why don't you try? And I was like, really? I could try? Really? Me? I could try? Yeah. So that's what happened. Uh, as a uh, photo model or? Yeah. yeah. 
and it was funny. My, it was a funny story. My very first job was a television. No, my first job was a, a, a bridal photo. I had to wear a, a wedding dress, and my second job was for Cosmopolitan magazine. It was a television commercial, and they said, "Okay, you have to show up at this house with a dressing gown." And it's a TV commercial. This good. You have to bring your own accessories, and you need a dressing gown. I was like, okay, I don't have a dressing gown, so I borrowed my mother's blue dressing gown, and I showed up at this house, and there was a TV crew, and it was for Cosmopolitan, and they said, okay, Julie, so we want you to walk in the door, open the door, walk in the door, and there's a man standing on the other side, and we need you to step up to him and put your head on his shoulder. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay. So I walked through the door and I put my head on his shoulder and said, okay, that was great, now we'll do it. So they did two cuts and they were like, okay, thank you very much, Julie, that was very nice, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> I left, I was like, well, that was interesting. Three weeks later on the television it came out, Cosmo, buy the new edition of Cosmo, uh, the new diets from Hollywood, uh, the, what's happening in the horoscope, and miscarriage, how it affects your marriage. <laughs> And that was me walking through the door and putting my head on some man's shoulder. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Well, you located in New York. What was the fascination with New York? After I left Australia, I went to Japan, then I went to Italy, and then I went to Paris. And this was, in the 80s, the center of the fashion world. We all, there was a circuit we all did. All the models went to Europe to get beautiful pictures, and then we came here to make money. <laughs> Can you tell if a marriage will last when you do a wedding? Oh, people ask me that question always. No, I can't. Yes. I have no idea what makes two people stick. Sometimes the couples that you are fighting from the first minute, you think, oh, gee, this is really hard, and yet they find a way to that fight together style. and they enjoy fighting. <laughs> they found someone to fight with and they stay together. Well, coming back to photography, I think, again, I have a really important role to play because yeah. I think that if I can take photos of couples that look like they're really having a good time together, if I can capture those moments that when things get hard and they look at them, they go, oh, yeah, okay. I think that they, I think that really nice photos of people doing things together can be really good for people's relationships. Well, <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Julie. Uh, so uh, we've learned a lot from Julie, and that is um, there's a way to live life in beauty. Uh, partly she learned it from her photographer friend, Bob, when she was a model, soft lighting, soft lighting, but also soft words of compliments that she feels is her uh, one of her purposes of life to give compliments and feel better with her. And that's the way she establishes intimacy when she's taking wedding pictures. And she tries to do that immediately, something we could learn with all our relationships. And whether it's touch, distance, or closeness, a compliment, uh, all of that is important in establishing that relationship where people can relax, something that we can all do in our lives with others. The other thing that I um, really liked was her ambition and the willingness to go up uh, for her uh, acting trial or tryout and to try to do it again when she was asked to do a model and her career went in another direction. You can't always tell where your life is going to take you, as all of us know, me, inclu <laughs> me included, and that even in modeling, she was trying to learn, trying to learn. And much of what she learned, she took with her, along with her gut and intuition, into her role as a photographer in life. And she's quick, and she likes to leave people with that feeling of happiness. So in the hard times, they have a touchstone. And so that is a useful profile for all of us to live when we are with others and ourselves. Not every day is beautiful in life, but we can find the beauty in it. So thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. And thank you, Julie. It's wonderful to talk with you today. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. 
See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.